Now I want to bring in my guests in studio. I'm joined by Aran Etzion, former Deputy National Security Advisor and former Head of Policy Planning in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Hi. as well as Yaniv Cohen Aviad, former analyst for the Israeli Shin Bet Security Forces. Hi. Thank you both so much for joining me. Uh, Iran, let's begin with you, as we <coughs> were just speaking to our correspondent who is in the South right now, speaking about these increased clashes that we're seeing in the Gaza Strip. Uh, as, as the IDF says, we're going in, we're, we're going to keep ramping up activity, and we are going to win. However, it's going to be a long journey. It's going to be difficult and tiresome. Yes. Well, we don't know enough about the real nature of the operation, nor do we um, are we capable at this point to assess the linkage or the relation between the strategic goals of the war, as defined by the cabinet, and the actual IDF operations, ground operations at least, at this point. We simply don't know enough. Uh, what we see so far is that there is penetration in, from several different points into northern Gaza and closing in on, on Gaza City. Obviously, fighting within Gaza City itself, a very densely populated urban area with allegedly multiple tunnels underneath, is going to be uh, extremely demanding. And that's, if indeed uh, that, that is the plan, that's, that, that is what we'll see next. Um, in terms of international legitimacy, time is running out for Israel. There's more and more criticism in the American press and elsewhere about the number of uh, civilians that, that are killed, 8,000, if, if I'm not mistaken, including 3,000 children. So um, Israel is uh, approaching a point when and it will have to decide uh, what exactly, to what extent it, it wants to, to continue its current course. Uh, but if or their to main alter goal it. is completely eliminating Hamas, they're just getting started with some of those main efforts. Well, it's a question what the main goal is. There, there are several interpretations and several uh, manifestations of that goal from total elimination of Hamas, which is completely unrealistic and not viable, to severely curtailing Hamas's military capabilities, which is more realistic and indeed is going to take months. But, um, you know, exactly how do you do that and to what uh, degree do you have to penetrate Gaza I mean, uh, in terms of ground operations are all questions that uh, we simply don't know yet because Israel, justifiably so, is not revealing its, uh, its operational plans. And, and what happens next continues to be a, one of the main questions that people are asking. What happens next in the Gaza Strip? I mean, uh, Yaniv, for, for the past years, we've seen the whole idea of containment, that we can contain Hamas within the Gaza Strip, but it seems like now more and more people are coming out against that whole ideology. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that the containment uh, perception has quite collapsed after uh, 7th of October. Um, we are dealing with an enemy who his purposes is to destroy us. Um, he's not thinking rational. We thought he's thinking rational. Uh, he doesn't really care about his uh, people and their prosperity. Um, this is part of the things we will have to change in mind and uh, perception. Um, the main goal of this uh, war, and it was declared uh, officially, is the destruction of uh, Hamas and the Jihad. Um, all their capabilities, especially the military ones. Um, but it is not enough. Uh, we have to think about the day after. We have uh, to think about our policy. Um, the main thing is the no more deals, no more agreements, no more containment. We always have to um, hold the initiative at ours. We have to initiate um, everything. Um, and not let them um, get stronger, because once we let them, they always think of their main goal, and their main goal is to destroy us, nothing else. And we have to take this in mind. And when we talk about what happens next, clearly with all eyes from an international perspective on the Gaza Strip, the international eyes will continue to be on the Gaza Strip following this and following exactly who runs it and who continues to look after the Palestinian civilians in the Gaza Strip. Yes, again, uh, I think we don't know enough. Um, kind of the subtext of your question uh, presupposes that there is a situation in which Israel has already taken control of the entire Gaza Strip, has eliminated, decimated all Hamas military capabilities 
has annihilated Hamas civilian and military uh, political rule of, of the Gaza Strip. And now the question is, who will take it from there? I'm not sure we'll get to that stage at all. And if so, it will take months, if not years. But yes, you're right. If at some point we do get to this stage, there's going to be a question of who exactly will be willing, if any, to replace Israel as the occupier of, of Gaza, something that Israel did for 40 years and then decided to uh, change course. And uh, unless we have very close coordination with Egypt, with the US, with several other Arab countries that might, under very, very particular circumstances, political circumstances, diplomatic circumstances, be able to somehow uh, be part of a political plan for the so-called day after, uh, the planning of which needs to start yesterday, and I'm not sure has started at all. Unless we do that, we're going to be sucked in into reoccupation of Gaza, which runs completely against all our national interests. I, I want to continue to talk about exactly what was happening before in the Gaza Strip. As you mentioned, just the intel that we continue to have and the questions that continue to remain, not only going after that, obviously, Israel will have a lot of questions to answer for, but October 7th definitely posed just a main big question, how did this happen? And now we're learning more information that security forces, specifically the former defense minister, back in 2016, published something to the government saying Hamas is a major threat. They have plans, and they plan to come into these Israeli communities, kidnap people, outlining everything that happened in 2023 back in 2016. Why was nothing done? Well, this is the $1 million question. But still, there are some facts we have to state. Um, the security system did think about such a scenario, not in such an, uh, numbers. But I uh, remind you, after the 2014 operation, the Tsukeitan, uh, there was a very um, clear um, uh, scenario about the um, um, attacking uh, tunnels. Um, the security system did do some things. We did build an obstacle. We did build a fence, uh, a, quite of a clever one, mm -hmm. uh, which unfortunately um, now no wasn't enough. Um, there was an uh, elimination of the tunnels, um, but there was a conception. It was a deep conception that this is enough, that the obstacle will um, um, guard us. Um, this is a very uh, great matter to deal with now, and uh, we have to change our perspective uh, in looking up to the future. I'm curious, Iran, what's your take? Yeah, uh, I would divide it into essentially two parts. One is our concept, and the other is uh, the enemy's concept, at least the way we perceived it and still perceive it. In terms of our concept, um, we believed, multiple Israeli governments, especially under Netanyahu, but not only believed, that we can kind of um, shove away the Israeli-Palestinian question at large, and specifically the Gaza question, and not deal with it in terms of conflict resolution, but rather in terms of so-called conflict management. And we entered into this routine whereby we essentially accepted Hamas as the sovereign, uh, not state sovereign, but uh, non-state actor as a sovereign, within the uh, pre-67 borders, um, that uh, we essentially allowed and even uh, uh, cheered f uh, to, to govern uh, 2.3 uh, Gaza residents. And uh, whenever we needed uh, to kind of uh, nudge it back into the agreed course, we did it through those so-called rounds of violence every couple of years. And this was the status quo. And after each round of violence, we went back to the so-called status quo. And we now realize that there was an evolution. It was not a status quo. And the evolution was in terms of Hamas's capabilities, Hamas's intentions, Hamas's understanding of, of our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities, both strategically, internally, socially, politically, and militarily, operationally, in terms of defense and all of that, but on, on, across all those domains. So we were under a certain illusion, a certain misconception. Hamas, unfortunately, was not, and read us better than we read it. And then the question is, why did Hamas decide? What was exactly Hamas' strategic calculation 
uh, in, uh, that led to the decision to launch this strike at this particular point in time. And here there are several po possible propositions uh, we don't know yet. One has to do with the uh, internal situation in Israel uh, and the fact that we uh, underwent 10 months of uh, excruciating internal crises that uh, exposed our vulnerability as a nation, as a society, and was a temptation for Hamas, for Hezbollah, for others to attack us. That's number one. Number two is the approaching so-called Saudi deal, the trilateral uh, US-Saudi-Israeli deal that from Hamas' perspective was possibly a threat, both in terms of um, Saudi entering into a more considerable role uh, in the region in a, w in a way that uh, threatens Iran, threatens potentially Hamas and Islamic Jihad's interests, but also in terms of uh, um, kind of pushing further away and further down the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on the international stage which was the whole strategic frame that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu built from the Abraham Accords through the uh, Saudi deal. It's, uh, this alleged understanding that we can strike normalization with Arab countries and quote-unquote resolve the Israeli-Arab conflict without touching the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which from Hamas perspective, from an overall Palestinian perspective, was a, a grave danger. So there was a mixture of all of those, possibly, Plus more operational considerations, looking at you know, uh, certain regiments that were uh, shifted from the Gaza border to the West Bank for various kind of uh, coincidental uh, considerations. Certainly a lot of questions that we'll continue to be looking at as the days, weeks, months unfold following this war and really the aftermath that did happen on October 7th. And I think that's what's most important to focus on, uh, why this war is even taking place right now. And it's because of the brutal attack on these southern Israeli communities on October 7th.